had heard of Foster Campbell. Everybody ready? Okay. I had heard of Foster Campbell many, many times over many, many years, but I had not had an opportunity to hear him uh, speak his mind, if you will, until uh, Cal Cashew Democratic Parish Executive Committee had their banquet out there in Lake Charles. Uh, and it was an awesome, joyous event, but it was, it was something about uh, the, what, what our public service commissioner up there in North Louisiana had to say uh, that resonated with me. And again, it goes back to that Huey P. Long theme uh, about the people, being about the people. And it stuck with me, especially because he is a public service commissioner. And to hear him speak about being for the people over business, to me that was very powerful, especially here in the state of Louisiana, again, the what? The red state, they say. Right? But uh, he, he helped me to, uh, well, I always knew it, but he reminded me that as red as they want to say we are, in our heart of hearts, we are tried and true Democrat blue. And so with those few words, I want to introduce to you Public Service Commissioner Foster Campbell. And I have someone's glasses, if anybody came to the podium and left their glasses, just raise your hand, I'll bring it to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me down here tonight. Uh, I would have walked down here tonight. There's just a few things I want to say, and I've been biting my tongue for about. Well, I really never get this to talk too much. That's a lie. But there's some things I want to talk to y'all about that you ought to know about. I live up in North Louisiana. And I came to Baton Rouge when I was 27 years old as one of the youngest senators ever until Cleo Fields came when he was about 22. When I came to Baton Rouge, I had brown, high, brown hair and two eyes. <laughs> so I don't have the brown hair anymore and I got one eye. But I still have a lot of hope and I still have a lot of uh, ambition for the state of Louisiana to do good. I want to start off by saying that uh, I remember that I, I'm a great fan. And don't, you can go ahead and question me on, you're not going to believe it, but I know who John Lee Hooker is, Gate Mouth Brown, Timmy Reed. You don't know any more than I know. But there's a song that y'all ought to be playing around here that Jerry Butler sang. And he sang more than one song, Miss Brown. But he had a great song, and the song was named Only the Strong Survive. And that's what we ought to be talking about tonight, Only the Strong Survive. We have a big job ahead of us, and it can be done. I watched the legislature this week, and I tried my best to help calling people when I could call. Fight big oil companies. And it's hard, hard to win when you have the governor against you and you have all the money in the world against you. You have to realize these are the strongest corporations in the world. These are not state corporations. They're not United States corporations. These are multinational companies that put profit over people or over states. There are states that these oil companies have done business in or countries where they've taken over certain dictators. All they want to know is, can we do business? I want to read out tonight some people that I'm proud of. These are people who stood up, and not all of them were Democrats, and I want to give them credit too. In the Senate, Senator Broom, Senator Rossi, Ed Hearn, Ben Nevers, 
Sharon Carter Peterson. In the House of Representatives, Regina Barlow, John Bell Edwards, Franklin Foster, Mark Green, Dan James, Eddie Lambert, who's a friend of mine and is a Republican but a good fellow. He stood tall and tried to help. Tricia Smith and Alfred Williams. These are people who took the people's interest on the special interest. I know about the problems in Louisiana. I came out of a classroom. I taught at a little place called Plain Dealer. And when I started teaching, I taught all black students. That was before integration. And I loved it for two years. I stayed there. Then I moved to Houghton High School. And I stayed there a couple of years. Then I ran for the Senate and got elected. But I've always been on the side of public education, trying to do the best we can to help everybody. But we all know about the problems in Louisiana. First of all, you got a huge deficit. Second of all, it cut the higher education budget by as much as 70%. Cost of erosion is the biggest problem we all face because it's eating our coast away. As we speak tonight, every hour they erode one football field. You can imagine that. We've lost more coast than the state of Connecticut. The roads are terrible. You will not believe this, Governor, but this is the truth. We have roads going back to gravel. State roads that are going back to gravel. I have a road in Bossier Parish where they will not fix a bridge, and they've told the landowners they're going to just stop the road. Incredible. I've never heard that before in my life where a state road, I'm not talking about a parish road, I'm talking about a state road where they don't have the money to blacktop. It's also happening in the soda parish. State roads going back to gravel. We've gone from Huey Long gravel to blacktop, now we're going from blacktop to gravel. <laughs> but there's an answer, and I've been for this for years, and I can tell you how to get out of the problem. But it's going to take some legislators with some backbone, you're going to have to lecture people. You're going to have to ask them these questions before you vote on them. They'll promise you anything while they're running. Oh, I'll be with you. I'll do this. I'll do that. But then you need to check these records like you did last week and see if they're really going to be with you. All right. What we need in Louisiana is an oil and gas processing tax on all the oil that passes through the state of Louisiana. History. When oil was first discovered over around Jennings, early 1900s, and then up in Caddo Parish and other parishes, in the 1920s they passed a law in the legislature and they put in our constitution that the only tax you could charge was a tax on domestic oil. That was fine in the 20s because most of the oil that's refined in the 20s was domestic oil. But they have that in our Constitution that the only tax can be charged is a tax on domestic oil. Let me tell you what's happened since 1920-2014. Today we refine 95% foreign oil in the state of Louisiana and we, and we only refine 5% Louisiana oil and we tax the 5%. This great Exxon refinery right here in Baton Rouge, it's a big refinery and everybody says, oh yes, it gives us jobs. I know it gives jobs. What do you think? They have to have people to work there. I appreciate the jobs. But get this statistic. The Baton Rouge refinery refines 99.2% domestic oil, um, foreign oil and 0.8% Louisiana oil and we tax the 0.8%. You want to know how to turn Louisiana around? You change the way we tax oil and gas. That would make Bobby Jones jump this high. That would make Bobby jump this high. And that would make all the business groups in Baton Rouge jump this high. Here's what the oil companies are going to say. Well, if you do that, we're going to leave Louisiana. Or we're not going to hire these people. Let me give you something to think about. Louisiana has about 80,000 miles of pipeline going from the Gulf of Mexico right on through the rest of the United States, all the way to Detroit, all the way to Chicago, all the way to New York, out to uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles. They, we have the Mississippi River that they can't move. <laughs> we have 
all the refineries that other states don't know. Do you think you could put a refinery in North Carolina where they have all those great schools up there? Like uh, Duke University of North Carolina, those great schools that they have in North Carolina, one of the most progressive states in the South. Do you think they want an oil refinery? Not on your life. We have them here. We like the jobs they produce. But all companies have got away with murder ever since you ain't long left. Now, simply, you know, we, we, uh, we were talking about this coastal erosion. I was amazed. Oh, boy, when BP blew out, you could see Bobby Jindal on TV every night. Oh, BP's terrible. Good God, it's going to ruin the world. You can see David Bitter down there. Oh, it's terrible. You see, all the politicians that you can't find out with a flashlight were down there hollering. BP is minuscule compared to the problem with eroding coast. That explosion of that well is about this much compared to this ceiling with us losing all our coast. And where did Bobby Jindal and Mr. Bitter and the rest of them, where have they been the last week or two or the last month? On the side of the oil companies. On the side of the oil companies. I want to remind you now, give you a little history lesson. When I was in the Senate, we had an Attorney General from Lake Charles, a Democrat. He wanted to sue Richard Ayub. He wanted to sue the backer companies. You remember that? Yeah. And we had a Republican governor named Mike Foster. You remember that? Yeah. Well, let me give you Mike Foster's famous words. Nobody makes people smoke. I like that. Nobody makes people smoke. Right. Now we've had these, as Ben said, we've had all these great hospitals since the 17, 1700s. Hospital, Big Charity, New Orleans, E.A. Conway and Monroe, LSU Hospital, Shreveport are along here. And when poor people got sick with emphysema, cancer of the lung, heart problems, things that we know were caused by cigarette smoking, taxpayers took care of them and we were glad to do it. Because they were poor, and we had the facilities to do it. So here comes Mike Foster and Bobby Jindal. Mike Foster makes Bobby Jindal the head of DHH and 24. You would think a guy that's ahead of all the hospitals would know that cigarette smoking causes cancer of the lung. You certainly would think that this fellow would have enough sense to realize after all of the statistics are out there, that cigarette companies actually put more nicotine in to make more people addicted. And that's what the lawsuit's about. But Bobby Jindal stood solidly writing a letter to Richard I.U. He was against this lawsuit. Well, what happened? We sued and we got $4 billion. And I was able to pass a Louisiana Educational Excellence Fund, which is a twin brother to the fund that Mr. Edwards helped me do up in Bozier. We got a billion dollars for all the school kids in Louisiana. And we got money to help people quit smoking. But if we listened to Bobby Jindal, we wouldn't have had the four billion. Now here he comes again. He doesn't want to sue the oil companies. But let me tell you what. The second you get the money from suing somebody or getting the money, he'll be leading the parade and said, I did it. <laughs> It's time for us to get together, and we need to put the oil companies in their place of providing jobs and tell them we appreciate that. But you cannot tell me, there's no person in this room can tell me why Louisiana is not one of the most progressive states in the South with all our oil and gas revenues that we've had during the years. I can tell you why we're not. We have too much special interest over the people's interest, and that has to stop. If you want Louisiana to have the good roads, you want to have the good highways, you want to have the good schools, it takes money, and it needs to be spent wisely. I'm not talking about spending it foolishly. It needs to be put in the classroom where the rubber meets the road, and that's what we have to do. Also on the Public Service Commission, I've been working on something with Donald Hunter. I want you to hear this. I am leading the way 
to stop the outlandish calls, jailhouse phone calls to parents. I want you to know that there's a hundred thousand people outside of jail that have not have not done anything. I'm innocent. But when their loved ones try to call, if some man's in jail, he calls his son or his daughter, some lady calls her daughter, the calls are astronomical. I'm going to briefly tell you what they do. And I'm having hell getting this done. If you call somebody, they're already paying 30 cents over a minute, so it's way, way enough money. Here's what happens. They put on extra charges. You give them a credit card for $50, they take $10 for origination fee, like that. This will make Payday Loan Company look like they had the first reader. <laughs> they take $10 right out of your bank, down to $40. If you give them your phone number and your wife wants to give her phone number, $250 extra, down to $37.50. If you don't use the whole $37.50, you use $20, you want to call and say, call up and get our money back. You got $17.50 coming to you, I said, no, 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 we're going to take five to give you your $17.50 back. And then don't leave it there over 30 days because they sweep the account and take all the money. So I want you to get up and do something. Reverend Bossy ain't helping me, but the new senator over there, I mean the new congressional congressman, commissioner, whatever he is, Mr. Angel, is <laughs> getting a little nervous. We need a little help. Now, my chairman, a big Republican chairman, Mr. Scametta, took $20,000 from these companies that are under investigation, and he's leading the way to make sure these charges remain on the people of the state of Louisiana, which is a sin. I'm going to end this by saying this. We had people come and testify from the Catholic Church, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, and the Catholic Church. A uh, 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 Episcopal priest got up and said this. I want you to listen to this. I'm no preacher, but I might could be. <laughs> <laughs> the preacher said this, and it stuck with me. This is an Episcopal priest who, who supports doing something with jailhouse phones. He said, and I paraphrase, this was Jesus talking now, not a disciple. This was Jesus when he said, when I was called, you gave me a coat. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in jail, you visited me. What you do for the least of these, you do to me. Now, then he asked my commissioners, and he didn't shake, what would you say if Jesus was sitting right next to me here, which he was? What would you say? What do you think Jesus would say? Would he say, go ahead and make that excess profit? Or would he say, help the people that need the help? I guarantee you, if that was the question, we all know what he would say. What you do to least of these you do to me. But money has infected the political system so bad that you can't get people to do the right thing when it's verbatim from the Bible. That's tough stuff. Thank you for having me tonight. I'll, uh, I want to thank you. payday loan companies because I had the payday bill 15 years ago. I did. It was a criminal penalty if they didn't pay the bills. I reduced it to a civil penalty. And is it amazing, again, that they tried to kick payday loan companies out of the state that are charging 700% interest and you can't get the vote in a Republican legislature. That's tough stuff. Thank you.